Good afternoon. Uh, I'm not totally a stranger to this Santa Barbara area. Uh, in fact, I lived for a year just off the campus on Moore Mesa uh, 20 years ago, 1972, when I was commuting to Ventura as a uh, district attorney, deputy district attorney prosecuting criminal cases. People still remember that as a time when crime was uh, lowered enormously throughout the region. Um, <laughs> but um, uh, on weekends, I would be up here, of, uh, of course, at uh, home, and I used to go bicycling through the campus. And one of the things that I remember was that on weekends, there weren't a lot of people on the campus, uh, uh, partly because there's so many other wonderful things to do. So. Um, I, I had a feeling that it would not be an absolutely packed house uh, on, a, on a beautiful Sunday afternoon in Santa Barbara, but I'm very glad to, uh, to see all of you who were able to come out. As you know, I am a, a, a criminal, sometime criminal lawyer and a professor of uh, law, especially criminal law, at the University of California. When I teach uh, my students about criminal law and police procedure, I try to give them a feeling for the ways that different actors in the system think. So that I talk about judge think, and I talk about cop think, and I talk about suspect think. You know, so that if you have a situation, for example, that there's a, a, a suitcase, let's say, um, and a, a dog that is trained to spot drugs has alerted to the presence of drugs in this suitcase, a judge think would be, ah, yes, the officer should now go and find a judicial officer and get a search warrant to search that suitcase. Whereas, of course, a policeman will think, oh, what a lot of bother. Who would want to do that? Um, let's see if there's some other way we can do that without going through all of this trouble. So that they, they naturally have their, their own viewpoint on the situation because of the, the different roles that they play in the system. So what I thought I might do in this lecture is tell you something about different kinds of um, uh, of thinking that's going on about Darwinian evolution, some of it in response to my book, which is, I'm glad to say, still getting some uh, reviews uh, uh, month by month. I think there were three last month, even though it's almost two years since it's been out. Most of the reviews are pretty critical, I must say, but I'm glad to be getting the attention anyway. Uh, and it's given, given me a, a lot of opportunity to uh, examine the thinking of other people who deal with these scientific and philosophical subjects. So I'm going to tell you about skeptic think, that is skeptics with regard to Darwinism. That's like me. Um, I'll tell you something about scientific reductionist think. Um, I'll tell you something about philosopher of science think uh, to give you a sense of the way that uh, different people are uh, coming to grips uh, with the problems that have been identified uh, with the reigning scientific paradigm that tells us how we got to be here. Um, now first, um, uh, an introduction to my own views. This is skeptic think. I'm a skeptical about the Darwinian theory of evolution, the paradigm that dominates biological science in our time. Now what does that mean and what, what, what is one skeptical about? Well, the first thing that this skeptic does is to identify the issue. What is the question that's important? Uh, what is it we need to think about? Um, and in that case, there are some things that aren't very important. For example, somebody will say, well, does evolution occur? Well, that depends what you mean by evolution. Um, one of the uh, most prominent examples of evolution in action that all of the books cite is the breeding of domestic animals, or uh, of uh, selective uh, breeding of plants. So you have dog breeding, for example, that gets us all these chihuahuas and Great Danes and whatever. And people will say, well, that's evolution. Well, that certainly does happen. We do have these breed of dogs. Dog breeding does occur. Um, and uh, it's certainly also the case that there is a degree of variation uh, that occurs in plants and animals. If, for example, um, a, a couple of uh, uh, birds uh, migrate to an offshore island and there become isolated and inbreed for generations. There will be a degree of uh, variation that will occur. Um, the processes of migration, inbreeding, mutation, genetic drift, natural selection will produce uh, varieties or even new species of birds which are somewhat different from the mainland population of uh, a similar bird. So 
um, evolution in this sense is not really an, an issue. It's um, an observable process. It's an easily inferable process. Um, and it's no big uh, a problem. The question that a skeptic is interested in is the big question. How do you get birds in the first place? Um, the most famous example of evolution in action that is cited in all the books, that is the most famous proof of the uh, process of Darwinian evolution by natural selection, uh, is the case of the peppered moth in the Midlands of England. Uh, during a, a period of time, there was a population of moths which had predominantly light-colored uh, moths in the population, a minority of dark-colored moths, but when the trees were darkened by industrial smoke, the number of dark moths rose and the number of light moths, relatively speaking, declined. Uh, so that for a time you had more dark moths and fewer light moths. And then when the trees became light colored again, uh, due to cleaning up of the air by air pollution laws, uh, the birds could uh, see the dark moths against the light trees better um, ate them with abandon, and you had a return to the pre-existing population. Um, a variation um, in the number of, of uh, light and dark moths. Uh, there were light and dark moths throughout the period of time. Nothing new appeared. Nothing was created. Um, and uh, that's uncontroversial. What the skeptic wants to know is, how do you get moths and trees and birds and scientific observers in the first place? Um, and that's the question that uh, uh, we want to know. How do you start with a simple uh, bacterial cell uh, uh, and uh, over a period of time, uh, as the theory uh, claims uh, it has happened, uh, you get a complex uh, plants and animals. Uh, through the operation of nothing but purposeless material natural processes. That's what's supposed to happen. What the skeptic wants to know is, is that true? Uh, do we know how such a thing can happen? Uh, did it happen as the Darwinian theory says it must have happened through a combination of random genetic changes, mutations, recombination, whatever, random genetic changes uh, plus uh, the sifting, selecting force of natural selection, which is the brute fact that some creatures are better at surviving and reproducing than others, and therefore leave more offspring than others, and therefore uh, come to dominate the population. So that's the question the skeptic wants answered. And how did all of this come about in the first place? How do we get from very simple things to very complicated living things, eventually to ourselves, Indeed, how do we get life started in the first place? Now, in order to focus on that question, this skeptic has found that it's almost essential to adopt a new vocabulary. And the reason is that the old vocabulary is calculated to divert attention uh, from the main issue. Because the old vocabulary speaks of evolution. And evolution turns out to mean just about everything except the strictest form of six-day, young earth, biblical, a fundamentalist, special creation. Um, evolution means dog breeding. Evolution means the variations in the shapes of the beaks of finches on the Galapagos Islands, the variation that occurred, as I've indicated, following migration from the mainland. Um, one uh, eminent professor of my acquaintance um, uh, told me that I must be completely wrong. The theory of evolution must be true because there are flightless birds on Hawaii. Um, he said uh, those birds uh, obviously migrated from a mainland somewhere, and uh, due to inbreeding in Hawaii, they lost the ability to fly, and yet nonetheless they survived uh, until uh, predators were introduced to the islands um, in the uh, 19th century following uh, their discovery by uh, uh, you know, European uh, explorers. Uh, and then, uh, then the flightless birds uh, became extinct. Well, isn't that evolution? Uh, well, of course it is. But what we want to know is not how a bird which was able to fly could become so degenerate as to lose that ability, but rather how 
birds got the ability to fly in the first place, how they became birds. So um, uh, the word evolution inherently distracts attention uh, from the main question. If you say, I want to know how you got birds in the first place, somebody will say, well, the answer is evolution, and look at that breeding that's done. Look at those variations that appear. That's evolution, uh, therefore that's the answer. Evolution means um, uh, uh, everything from the smallest variations to the grand creation story of how we got um, complex plants and animals in the first place. So what I do uh, to try to put attention on the main point is to put aside that misleading word evolution and to speak of what I call the blind watchmaker thesis. Now, the blind watchmaker thesis uh, comes from the title of a book by Richard Dawkins, the eminent Oxford University zoologist. And Richard Dawkins uh, tells us at the beginning of that book that living things appear to be extremely complex entities which look as if they were designed by an intelligent creator for a purpose. Um, that is to say that they look as if they were created by a supernatural being. But, says Richard Dawkins, they were not uh, because we know that the forces of random genetic change and natural selection, purely unintelligent material forces, were in fact capable of doing all of this creating and did uh, do it. That's the blind watchmaker thesis, the thesis that random genetic change and natural selection rather than pre-existing intelligence and purpose uh, is behind the existence of all of the extremely complex plant and animal beings including ourselves which now populate the planet. Now it's that thesis, the blind watchmaker thesis, that the skeptic wants to look at because that's the important thesis. That's what really matters to people. It doesn't have tremendous importance outside of the scientific classroom or laboratory uh, itself, it, whether you can get a degree of variation in created things which already exist. Um, it's significant that we can breed dogs to get varieties which are particularly good hunters or show dogs or whatever. That's important for people who love dogs. It's important that we can get varieties of orchids. That's important for people who love varieties of flowers. Um, but it isn't of enormous philosophical importance. What's of enormous philosophical and religious importance to us is the question, are we here because a purposeful, intelligent being brought about our existence, or are we here because of the operation of material forces that have no intelligence and have no purpose and inherently can care nothing about us. Biological science, in the form of the Darwinian theory, purports to have answered that question. So is the blind watchmaker thesis true? Now this is the question that the skeptic wants to ask. Now the skeptic will again find a great deal of difficulty in asking that question. I've told you of one form of difficulty that will be presented. The skeptic will be told, we have enormous evidence of evolution. The subject will be changed, you see, to provide something simple, something minor, which can be proved. That will be called evolution, and evolution is the answer to how we all came into existence too, and so there's an end of it. Well, we'll put that aside. We've already seen that the word evolution can't be used as an all-purpose uh, answer uh, to the question, how did we get here? Another problem that the skeptic will immediately encounter, however, is that the skeptic will be told, the answer to your question is in the province of science. Science is committed to philosophical naturalism, and therefore science must assume that no creator and no purposeful intelligence is behind our existence. And that's an end to it. Now that is to say, by this means, an important question has been transformed into a non-question. 
The skeptic wants to ask, is it true what certain scientists tell us, that we are here as a result of purposeless natural forces rather than an intelligent creator? And the skeptic will be answered. Science is so defined that that must be the answer. The only question that science can address is not whether there is a purposeless means of creation, because purpose could come into existence only when it had evolved by purposeless means. All that science can address is the question of, granted that we are here as a result of purposeless material mechanisms, what's the most plausible purposeless material mechanism that we can imagine? And in that case, the answer will be the force that produced those variations in the population of light and dark peppered moths. Because that's what we can observe happening. It must be the same sort of thing writ large that produced moths and trees and scientific observers in the first place. And if the skeptic says, well, I'm not satisfied. I want to know, how do you know that? The answer will be, what is your alternative? We have given you a scientific answer. It is an answer which is scientific because it re rests only on things that we can observe, extending their effects enormously, to be sure, uh, but at least we can observe them doing a little bit. And if you don't like that answer, what better answer can you provide? You cannot answer that question by saying, I believe that a creator did the creating, because the skeptic will be told, that's a subject outside of science. We've already told you how we define science. Weren't you listening? We told you that science assumes that we are here as a result of purposeless material processes. So that is strike one. And if you say, well, how about the answer, we don't know, the skeptic will be told that isn't acceptable under the rules of science either. You don't know how science works because we have given you a scientific answer. If you don't like the answer, you're free to try to improve on it, but science does not operate by discarding what is already known and going right back to the beginning and saying, we don't know anything, we give up. We're going to turn it over to the priests or the metaphysicians uh, or the television commentators or something like that. Science stays with the answer it has, and no matter how many difficulties that answer is encountering, until or unless a better answer, which is fully naturalistic, um, and involves no creator, supernatural power, or whatever is produced. So the skeptic finds um, that in the attempt to ask the critical question, is the blind watchmaker th thesis true, uh, he has been met with a series of philosophical barricades that make that question practically impossible to ask in a university or scientific forum. Now, the conclu what conclusion does the skeptic come to uh, from all of this encounter? Of course, what I'm describing to you is the encounter that I have had over the years with my um, uh, many uh, 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 colleagues and uh, uh, debating adversaries and whatnot who have come from the camp of Darwinian belief. Well, it seems to the skeptic to be fairly clear what has happened that what has happened is this, um, is that science of a certain kind desperately wants to answer uh, from its own resources the question, how did we come to be here? In order to answer that question, it has to make certain very far-reaching and controversial assumptions, and then to protect those assumptions. And what has happened is this. Um, that in the 19th century, a scientist became aware of a way in which they could explain how certain small-scale changes occur in beings which are already in existence. Uh, this was the original version of the Darwinian theory of evolution. Uh, Charles Darwin advanced this theory 
to challenge the position that he stated as the alternative, that the species are immutable. That is, that every species today is exactly the way it has always been in the past. Now, he was able to show with some success, uh, with a great deal of success, that that straw man proposition is not true. That is to say that there has been variation and change in the kinds of living creatures that exist, that they have changed somewhat, just as those island species uh, change over time, that they are modified uh, uh, somewhat from what they were before. Uh, moreover, a science was able to show, and quite convincingly, um, that there are diff that different kinds of beings have lived on the Earth at different times. The fossils record many species, and many types of creatures, such as the dinosaurs, um, that existed in the past and that do not exist today. Uh, some of the creatures that exist today appear only late in the geological column, or relatively later than other creatures. So there seems to have been some change in the kinds of living things that lived on the Earth at different times. Armed with that information, uh, an adventurous band of scientists said, well, why don't we posit that the same force that produces these minor changes that shows change in the species uh, could be responsible uh, for all of the work of creation, uh, from the very simplest uh, first being all the way to the present, and treat that um, as our starting point for further research, and accept that as an explanation for everything that has happened. And the explanation was so satisfying to the scientific mind. It was so, um, uh, it seemed to explain so much if it were true, that it became very dear and very cherished. Um, and indeed, it changed the world. Um, it enabled the scientists to become uh, the most important cultural authorities uh, of their society, uh, replacing the, the uh, uh, clergy, um, and um, uh, it had enormous consequences for the way uh, people came to see themselves, and eventually it became to be a fundamental truth and doctrine to be cherished and protected uh, rather than a mere hypothesis to be tested against the evidence. Um, and so, uh, by this process of extrapolation, a solution to a very minor part of the history of life uh, became accepted and protected as the story of all creation. Um, and even now, when it is clear um, to a great many skeptics within the scientific world uh, that the evidence does not support uh, the claim uh, that life evolved in a series of tiny step by tiny step increments, as the theory um, uh, 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 says, um, the theory has been protected uh, by that all-purpose philosophical response, what is your alternative? Now, that's what, the way the skeptic thinks. Um, and as, as uh, some of you probably know from having read the book, perhaps from having read some of the many reviews that have been come about, come about there's been a, a tremendous amount of debate about all of those propositions in the skeptical uh, case. Most of that debate has centered upon the philosophical issues uh, rather than on the accuracy of any particular piece of scientific uh, information. Um, and um, there is uh, no great mystery in my mind as to why that is the case. Um, there is, in fact, as, as so much information which is tremendously difficult to reconcile with the Darwinian paradigm that many of the most eminent authorities who have supported that paradigm uh, from time to time um, uh, have, in fact, acknowledged uh, the existence of a fossil, a fossil record, for example, which is tremendously difficult uh, to reconcile with Darwinian expectations. My formidable adversary, Stephen Jay Gould, uh, even described in one of his papers the Darwinian theory as effectively dead, and then came back later to defend it, uh, precisely because he realized that there was no alternative, um, and that to abandon the Darwinian theory was to abandon for the moment the claim that science has solved the mystery of how we got here. Uh, but there's been a tremendous amount of controversy over the book, and now that I've given you a picture of the skeptic think, I want to t tell you about how a couple of very prominent critics have reacted to the skeptic's argument and to the argument of the book. Uh, one of those critics is not a biologist, it's a great physicist, uh, Steven Weinberg. 
the Nobel Prize winning physicist, uh, who is uh, the principal author of the electroweak theory, uh, which is uh, a first step uh, towards the dream of a grand unified theory that will unite all of the forces of uh, physics into a grand synthesis um, and be the greatest scientific accomplishment of all time. Um, this um, is the dream which is discussed in a book that probably many of you have seen, either the book or the movie that was made of the book, uh, Stephen Hawking's A Brief History of Time. It's been the subject of many other books with titles like The Theory of Everything, The Mind of God, The God Particle, or in Steven Weinberg's case, Dreams of a Final Theory. Um, and uh, uh, I bring a physicist into this to show you how, because I think it's tremendously instructive, to show you how a great scientific intellect and one of the real rulers of science of our time uh, looks at the challenge to the Darwinian paradigm uh, from his perspective. Um, because Weinberg uh, uh, has just come out with a book for the general reader, quite a good book, uh, uh, called Dreams of a Final Theory. And he does me the honor of taking several pages in uh, uh, the book's uh, 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 next to last chapter to discuss my challenge to Darwinism. Um, in fact, he uh, does me the honor to call me the most respectable academic critic of evolution today, um, a title which I would take great pride in if I were not aware that Professor Weinberg has an extremely low opinion of all of the other critics of uh, evolution. <laughs> So that it's a little bit like being the sanest person in the uh, insane asylum or uh, the most honest man in state prison or something like that. But um, I'll take these honors uh, where I can get them without looking too carefully at the, the implications. Um, now, uh, one of the interesting things about Professor Weinberg's critique of Johnson's critique of the neo-Darwinian synthesis is that he was able to refute me without ever once looking at the book. Um, uh, that is to say, as far as one can tell from the book itself um, uh, and the reference notes to it, he relied entirely on an article I had written for First Things uh, magazine um, and had not bothered to look up the evidence in the book. He tells me that he has since looked at it and, uh, well, when we had a discussion of this in uh, Texas, but that doesn't appear from the book. Um, and he didn't have to, in part because he's a particle physicist and so far above biologists in standing um, that he doesn't really need uh, uh, to look at um, the details of the evidence, but, in, but mainly because it is a, it, he can tell that I must be wrong because I do not think as the scientific enterprise requires one to think. And that's really the point I want to emphasize to you today as I describe to you how a physicist a, uh, who is a scientific reductionist reacts to a, a criticism of um, a Darwinian theory. And his response is essentially to say, so Johnson has shown that the neo-Darwinian theory is against the evidence at various points. So what? Essentially, the answer is, so what? He says, in, in making that point, Johnson simply shows that he doesn't understand how science works, a complaint that I am very used to hearing, I assure you. And specifically, he says, Johnson has no feeling for the problems that any scientific theory has in accounting for what we observe. There never was a time when the calculations based on Newton's theory of gravitation or any other theory were in perfect agreement with all observations. In the writings of today's paleontologists and evolutionary biologists, we can recognize the same state of affairs that is familiar to us in physics. In using the naturalistic theory of evolution, biologists are working with an overwhelmingly successful theory, but one that is not yet finished with its work of explication. It seems to me to be a profoundly important discovery that we can get very far in explaining the world without invoking divine intervention, and in biology as well as in the physical sciences. Now that is to say that the refutation of my claim that the Darwinian theory is strongly against the evidence when the evidence is considered objectively and without a bias in favor of the theory is to say 
lots of scientific theories have problems, but look at how successful we are. Why, for example, look at how successful the Darwinian theory has been. Um, the, the theory itself is one of the great accomplishments of science, which he cites to show how successful it is and therefore how wrong the critic must be. Now, the reason for this is because the Darwinian evolutionary biology is part of a vast scientific reductionist program to which Weinberg's own work belongs. This is what I call, and he calls, the reductionist project. According to scientific reductionism, human mental life, our consciousness, our intelligence, our purposes, can be explained entirely in terms of the forces involved in chemistry. As one great um, biochemist, uh, Stanford's Arthur Kornberg put it, um, he was ast absolutely astonished to find that many otherwise intelligent people have not yet learned that the mind as a part of life is chemistry and only chemistry. You see, mental processes are fully explainable in terms of the chemistry of the brain. Similarly, according to reductionism, the life processes are fully explainable in terms of physics and chemistry. That is to say, there's nothing else except the laws of physics and chemistry that are involved in the origin of life and its maintenance today. Um, and the principles of chemistry at a more complex level are explainable in terms of the law of physics. And finally, everything comes down to the moment at the earliest instance of the Big Bang when only the particles and the theory which governed their interactions existed. You see, at that point, at the earliest moment in the history of the universe, when everything was compressed into a single point, nothing existed except particles, forces, and the theory that governs them, and the vast explosion of energy that followed. Um, why didn't anything else exist? Well, what else could have existed? According to Professor Weinberg, the only way that any sort of science can proceed is to assume that there is no di divine intervention and to see how far one can get with that assumption. That is, the way science proceeds is to assume that nothing exists except material forces, energy, and the relations between those uh, uh, forces, the energy and the material particles. Uh, matter, energy, the void, is all that exists. There's no pre-existing purpose, no mind behind everything, or, or whatever. Now you see, starting with that standpoint, it follows as a matter of elementary logic that everything exists today had its origin in the initial conditions at the beginning of the Big Bang. Um, that the vast explosion of energy and then matter that follows that is responsible for the existence of galaxies and stars, even though no one knows how galaxies were formed, um, and that um, the interactions of matter on uh, the resulting uh, uh, planets, particularly on Earth, um, were responsible for life arising without any purpose by being behind it, that life became more complex on its own steam, and that life generated, once it had gotten started, generated consciousness and intelligence. To deny that this is the true story of the entire history of the cosmos is to suggest that something else entered at some point from outside. And to suggest that that could be the case, says Professor Weinberg, would be to repudiate science. You say it would be to repudiate the whole scientific enterprise. And so that is why a critique of a particular part of that enterprise such as the neo-Darwinian paradigm, is of no particular interest. Something very much like neo-Darwinian evolution has to have occurred in any case, because there is no alternative within the reductionist view of the history of the cosmos. Um, if it didn't happen exactly as Darwin imagined it, it must have happened in some other way that likewise involves nothing but purposeless material forces because until life evolved and became complex enough to have intelligence and purpose, there was no intelligence and purpose around uh, to have any effect on the outcome uh, of physical processes. And so criticism of a particular plank in the reductionist platform is beside the point. Something very much like that must have happened anyway.
and if indeed the theories run stark into what seems to be disconfirming evidence, that simply shows that they are incomplete. Because, after all, in many areas of science, there's great difficulty in accounting for the facts. The theories seem not to explain all the facts. That's a reason to look for better theories, but never a reason to discard the scientific program, which in its broadest sweep is the reductionist program. Persons who are trying to explain how memories can be stored in the brain, how conscious life can be produced just by chemicals in the brain, face many difficulties. But they don't doubt that the process can be carried out. Uh, otherwise, their work would be hopeless. Uh, persons who are trying to explain how life arose may find that their experiments all end in futility, that they're forced to work, as indeed they are now, with distinct theories that are mutually contradictory. Um, and they seem to be getting nowhere. No matter, life must have arisen by purposeless chemical evolution because there is no alternative. And after all, Darwin explained in principle back in 1859 how you can get a, uh, once you get life jump-started as it were, started in any way, you can carry it all the way on up to complex plants and animals and human beings. And if anyone wants to say that that's not true, well, they must be wrong because it's the only thing that could have happened. Now, I'm using this example of the program of reductionist science and the way that the, um, uh, Darwini the critique of Darwinism that the skeptic has made can be answered without ever really looking at the details of the evidence. Uh, to raise the question, is what we have here an argument about the facts or is it an argument about a basic philosophical outlook by which the facts are to be determined? It would seem to me, having studied Professor Weinberg's critique and having discussed it with him personally, and the similar critiques of many other people from mainstream science, that in a sense, we almost aren't in disagreement about anything scientific. Uh, leading evolutionary authorities like Stephen Jay Gould, David Raup, and a number of others um, uh, will indicate uh, that, in fact, um, there's a vast amount of mystery about how large-scale evolution could have occurred. That is to say, they will indicate this when they feel secure, um, that they can indicate it. As I've said, uh, Professor Gould at other times has gone back to insist that there isn't any problem uh, when he feels under attack. But um, uh, the problem is that is simply that attack, um, that uh, there seems to be no doubt that there are many holes in the theory uh, but there's a philosophical sense that says something like this must be true anyway. Give us something that's better and we'll believe that. Until that, we'll stick with what we have. This seems to be a philosophical difference uh, rather than a difference in scientific knowledge, a difference in the kind of answer that one will accept. Indeed, a difference in whether we're willing to accept an answer that we don't know things. Um, and indeed, with Professor Weinberg. Um, it, it, what the disagreement that he had with me certainly didn't have to do with anything in the facts of evolution. In fact, he showed a complete indifference uh, to the um, uh, details of the uh, arguments over the facts. It was simply that purposeless materialistic evolution, the blind watchmaker thesis as I have called it, is an essential assumption that the scientific reductionist uh, uh, project must make if it is to pursue its goal of explaining all of the history of co the cosmos and all of life and all of everything that has happened in the history of the cosmos in purely naturalistic uh, terms. That is to say, without allowing any role to a creator or God. If one is going to try to do that, one must make certain assumptions. Well, I agree with that. But why do we have to make those assumptions? And why do we have to pursue that project? Well, that question now will bring me to the, the, next, uh, the second critic of uh, the skeptic's point of view that I'll mention, the philosopher of science and philosophy of science think. Because in addition to having had the honor of being criticized in uh, uh, Professor Weinberg's uh, book, um, uh, I had um, the honor this year of being the subject of a program at the American Association of the Advancement of Sciences um, in which uh, a speaker uh, was the philosopher of science, Michael Roos, a professor at a Canadian university, the, and the leading 
most influential expert witness for the evolutionist side in the famous equal time for creationism trial at, uh, in Arkansas in 1981 where the um, uh, Darwinists and the creationists had their, their uh, biggest battle in court. Uh, Roos had debated me at Southern Met Methodist University in a program uh, that was put together involving a number of people um, on my book um, in the spring of, uh, of uh, last year, of uh, 1992, um, and we'd had considerable interaction at that time. Well, as I say, in 1993, February, Roos was invited to do a program on me at the annual meeting of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Now, I was not invited to this program. Uh, uh, with respect to the uh, AAAS, I am in the status not so much of, of, a, of a scientific uh, uh, examiner as a laboratory uh, animal, I think, uh, <laughs> a subject of experiment and comment, but not one who is invited to participate in it. Um, uh, but friends of mine were at the um, gathering. The gathering was tape recorded for uh, sales. It wasn't an, anything that was at all private, and I received a transcript of the entire thing within hours. Um, and, and it was fascinating uh, because Professor Roos um, at this gathering said, at, at re uh, first uh, engaged in some of the ritual uh, Johnson bashing that was expected of him, uh, but then uh, very shortly into the program, he changed uh, direction enormously. Um, and he told the gathering that uh, in the first place that he had had a, a very interesting time at the debate at Southern Methodist University with me and the other uh, persons there who were participating. And that he had found that it, while it was easy to hate creationists in the abstract, um, as he calls everyone who dissents from the purely naturalistic and uh, paradigm of Darwinism, um, he found it hard to dislike us in person. Um, that we seemed uh, almost disconcertingly uh, friendly and uh, 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 fair in debate. Um, and that, in fact, the subject of the debate was the question that I've just put really at the end of my discussion of Professor Weinberg. Uh, it was a, a, the question about the role of metaphysical naturalism in sustaining the Darwinist paradigm. That is to say, the question which was put and which we debated uh, for three days in, uh, at Southern Methodist was, is a belief, a pre-existing belief in metaphysical naturalism a necessary component of the Darwinian evolutionary theory. I, I can put that in slightly different language that may make the issue a little bit easier for some of you un to understand. Uh, you might say, if, there, if we agree that there is no God, then we agree, don't we, that nature had to have the resources to do its own creating, because there wasn't anything else. And if you make that starting point assumption, you'll agree that, well, something very much like the Darwinian theory of evolution must be true, as it's sort of the best guess anybody can make about how you can do all that creating without a creator. But suppose that you're a person who isn't willing to make that assumption. That's the assumption of metaphysical naturalism. Nothing but nature exists. Suppose you think that there is a creator, there is a god, or at least that there might be one. In that case, do you have any good reason to believe that a creator would necessarily have proceeded on the basis of an accumulation of random genetic changes through natural selection? And the answer that I made and a number of us made was no. The evidence doesn't support that things happened that way. Once you allow an alternative to the blind watchmaker thesis to come under consideration. Um, well, um, what Ruth said almost a year later uh, in Boston at the AAAS convention was after having thought the matter over, he thought that he'd been perhaps rather naive at an earlier period in his life when he thought that the only reasonable thing to do was to accept the Darwinian theory as factual, that now he was inclined to agree that it involved an essential metaphysical component, naturalism. Essentially, that our side was correct in that debate and that you had to be committed to metaphysical naturalism to find Darwinian evolution convincing. Um, I'm told that when he finished his remarks and finished saying this, uh, there was a stunned silence uh, at the meeting. And I know that his remarks were greeted with great shock because I recently read an account of this meeting um, 
it was one, you know, a whole morning session at which a number of people spoke on related topics. Uh, Bruce was the most noted speaker of the group, but uh, not the only one on the program. Um, and uh, an account of the entire program was published in the Times Educational Supplement of the London Times um, just uh, last week. It's a very lengthy account, and it describes in detail what which was said by each one of the speakers. And it doesn't have a single word about Roos's lecture or that he appeared. And in, in light of the fact that he is by far the most prominent person who appeared there, and also the only Englishman at an American gathering, he's an Englishman who's teaching at a Canadian university, um, the fact that he disappeared entirely from history has a decidedly Orwellian uh, flavor to it. <laughs> and I, I can't wait to hear from Michael what he thinks about this when I bring it to his attention. Now, um, uh, so essentially, I, I want to give Roos credit. Essentially what he was doing is owning up to an intellectual problem that I think he's absolutely right about. Um, that is that the confidence that Darwinian evolution is the answer for how we got here is a deduction that one arrives at from the platform of metaphysical naturalism. Um, if there is no creator, then something like that must have happened. Uh, but if one does not make that conclusive presumption, um, then it seems rather more that what the Darwinian theory is, is the best guess that a, has been able to be made uh, by a scientific uh, community which is very eager to provide an answer to the question of how we got here, an answer that excludes a, a god, um, and very anxious to hold on to that answer, uh, but an answer which in fact is in conflict with the evidence at so many points that there's no reason uh, for most of us uh, to believe that it's true. Now, that's, I've given you um, the skeptic think and I've given you um, the reductionist think and I've given you um, the philosopher of science uh, a think on this. Um, uh, let me conclude uh, uh, by um, uh, answering a uh, briefly the question, what should we make all of this? So how is this uh, important to us and, and what does all this mean uh, to most of us? Well, I might start um, with a quotation from one of my Berkeley colleagues, a famous philosopher of science named Paul Feyerabend, uh, something of a, uh, a radical in that uh, profession, um, who remarked once, he said, scientists are not content with running their own playpens in accordance with what they regard as the rules of the scientific method. They want to universalize those rules. They want them to become part of society at large. And they use every means at their disposal, argument, propaganda, pressure tactics, intimidation, lobbying, to achieve their aims. Now that uh, may, might sound rather aggressive and even rather cynical. But in, in, in fa point of fact, what Professor Feyerabend was saying was that one of the things that is going on with the scientific community is an attempt to impose their metaphysics on the society at large uh, because they believe that it's a very good way for people to think. Uh, professor Weinberg is very explicit about this. So is Professor Roos, by the way. Uh, so is Professor Gould. So are many others. That is to say, Professor Weinberg writes in his book in discussing why it's so important to educate people about science that he hopes that they will come to an understanding that the world is run by impersonal forces that we are here as a result of impersonal material forces that care nothing about us, and that this will get rid of religion, which he regards as equivalent to superstition, and we'll all be better off. Um, this will make humanity at least more rational than it is, if not completely rational. Now, um, that's an interesting proposition. Um, and what it shows, I think, um, is that the program of science, of the kind of science that aspires to tell us the history of the cosmos, is a program that all of us have a stake in. Uh, because it's tremendous of importance to us to know the correct answer to questions like, are we here as a result of the action of a creator? Um, or are we um, uh, here as a result of material purposeless processes? We want to know the true answer, not to shield ourselves in some kind of an illusion. Uh, but we don't want to be misled uh, by scientific authorities who want us to believe one answer to that and who shape their evidence so that it can only support that answer. 
I think we want to, to know and, and uh, should want to know uh, whether, in fact, the evidence of science fairly evaluated supports this reductionist naturalistic program. It seems to me that it does not. In fact, it's a faith uh, which is in search of confirmation um, and which, uh, uh, because of that, has been uh, grace, greatly uh, misleading to people who think they are hearing the objective uh, voice of science. Now, it's tremendously important then that we be able to ask questions, that we be able to challenge the reigning philosophical points of view that authorities like Michael Roos have agreed are there, philosophical assumptions that some of us might not share, might not want to make. But one of the problems is, is there's an authoritarian aspect to a certain kind of scientific thinking. Professor Weinberg, for example, believes that it is no business of citizens to ask about the religious implications of science, even though he himself asks this in a chapter called, What About God? and lays down this law. Um, Time Magazine uh, comes out with a cover story in December of this year, the Christmas issue, asking the question, what does science tell us about God? And the answer it gives is plenty and more all the time, that we are to take our knowledge of ultimate issues of where we came from, from science, but according to many of the scientific authorities, we are not allowed to question the assumptions that generate uh, those answers. Now, I think that this is a line that the scientific world will not be able to hold. Um, I had been hoping that it would be a part of the outcome of my own work that open and fair and honest discussion of the metaphysical biases and assumptions of the Darwinian project, and now as I see, of the reductionist scientific project at large, will become possible. Um, and I see that that is beginning to happen. And as that becomes possible, it's going to be tremendously important that as many people as uh, can do so in the universities, as many students among those who are here and others as can do so, learn to understand those questions and learn to understand what the philosophical assumptions are so that they can participate in that discussion. Because you know, we're entering into a new century. We're entering into a time when many of the old answers are crumbling all over the world. We're entering into a time in which very new ways of thinking will be necessary uh, to preserve civilization from certain anarchic and disruptive influences that are even now tearing it apart. And a new century will have new kinds of knowledge and new kinds of scientific thinking. There's no reason to assume that the dogmas that dominated the 20th century will necessarily and always uh, dominate the future of science and the future of thinking. So we're in a very exciting time. I'm excited to be participating in opening up the issues. And I'm very glad that all of you came to uh, uh, discuss uh, these uh, subjects uh, with me. And I'm looking forward to any of the questions uh, that you want to ask now in the remaining time. But thank you very much. Stephen Jay Gould has said that the two key features of the uh, fossil evidence are sudden appearance and stasis. And it seems to me that over the past 20 years or so in the creation evolution debate, both evolutionists and creationists have been focusing on sudden appearance and trying to explain that, explain origins, uh, rather than the pervasive pattern of, uh, of natural history, and that is uh, stasis. I was just wondering if uh, in your talks with, with biologists, if uh, if they have come up with any uh, either genetic or developmental or uh, ecological mechanisms which may account for stasis, um, do you think natural selection could account uh, for the fact that major evolutionary change does not seem to occur in the fossil evidence? And two, does speciation prevent major evolutionary change uh, as a result of saltation? <laughs> Yeah. Well, I, I uh, think uh, um, that it's agreed. I, I mean that uh, uh, everybody um, that's uh, uh, writing about the fossil record now agrees that there is a prevailing pattern of stasis. That is to say, once things are in existence, they tend to stay more or less the same until they become extinct or until the present day if they're still around. Um, there's, there may be variation, and that is to say there's no change at all, but that there isn't change of a fundamental or directional nature.
that things um, stay, um, uh, w w that the variation is within the type and, and uh, back and forth or, or a limited uh, uh, a nature, and uh, that the, the pattern is this fundamental stability to things. Um, there's no doubt, and I think it's perfectly orthodox to say, that one of the major things that produces this, this uh, stability is natural selection. Uh, because um, if things should happen to mutate or change, the likelihood is that this will make them less able to survive because almost all observable mutations are harmful. Um, and so natural se selection tends to weed out mutants and tends to keep things um, uh, 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 within uh, pretty much uh, uh, as, uh, uh, as they are. Um, and there may well be other mechanisms of, of stasis uh, as well. But the, the, the problem is that, for the, from the evolutionary biologist's standpoint, that explaining the things in terms of stasis isn't terribly rewarding. Um, because um, while you can do it, um, and in fact it is done all the time, uh, another thing that is, is said is that there are developmental constraints. Only certain types of change are possible within the basic body plan that the animal has. Or most kinds of change would make it um, you know, out of sync with something else that, it, that natural selection would eliminate. So in a way, it's back to the, the problem of natural selection. But that's just explaining, explaining how things stay the same is not what evolutionary biologists have wanted to do. What they have wanted to do is to um, explain how things come into existence, to tell the creation story for the culture, as it were. And so the emphasis has been to say that, well, what, what, the way that, that, that stasis is interpreted, interpreted is that it means that the change must occur when it does occur sufficiently rapidly and perhaps in sufficiently po small populations that it doesn't get recorded. You never see it happening. You just see that there's one thing here and then there's something somewhat different over there. And so there must be a process of change that must have happened somehow um, that just didn't get recorded. And so, um, in a way, it's a very unempirical kind of, of interest because the, what is seen, the stasis, um, is, is, uh, is ignored. And for a long time, it couldn't even be reported in the scientific journals because it was thought to be of, of low interest. And what is, what, is in, what is hypothesized is the invisible process of change and development because that's what the culture wants. That's what, you know, what people want to provide. Uh, so um, um, when uh, Stephen Jay Gould and Niles Eldridge proposed the theory of punctuated equilibrium that many of you have heard of, uh, they both explained, uh, very frankly, that w what, what necessitated that theory was that it made it possible to report the prevailing fact of stasis in the fossil record, which had previously been regarded as not worth reporting in scientific journals because it was just non-evidence of evolution, and who cares about that? So after the theory of punctuated equilibrium, it could be reported as support for the theory that evolution occurs in bursts of change in small populations, and that's why you never see it. Um, now, to my way of thinking, of course, the interesting thing that the punctuated equilibrium controversy brought out was the problem.